After my parents got divorced I went to go live with my father. I would have preferred to live with my mother. But my parents agreed that since I was a boy I would live with him. A boy should be raised by his father honey. My mom said to me caressing my face. I love you. Be good for dad. Those were the last words my mother said to me as we left the courthouse. She got in her car and drove away. Dad and I got in his truck and did the same. I was 12 years old at the time. As the years went on, I would see my mother every other weekend from 5 p.m. on Friday until 5 p.m. on Sunday. Just like they agreed to. As well as Wednesday nights from 4 to 8. Mom kept the house, while Dad and I lived with his parents, my grandparents in their small cottage home. It was a little cramped, but we all seemed to manage. I had finally gotten used to the weekend visits with my mom, and the cramped living arrangements at my grandparents' house when my father threw a monkey wrench into the whole thing. He came home from work one afternoon and announced that he was offered the position of store manager for the Chestertown store. He accepted the position, and we knew we would be moving to Chestertown in two weeks. I was 16 at the time. Now, I had no idea where Chestertown was, so I asked my father. He had no idea either. He took out his phone, loaded up Google Maps, and typed in the address of the store. Come to find out, it was five hours away. I was not happy. I mean, I wouldn't be able to see my mom as much, and I'd have to leave my friends at school. Anyway, on the last day before we left, I spent the whole day with my mom. Unlike most divorces, my parents were civil toward each other and just grew apart over the years. So, when my mom dropped me off that night, she told me that my father and she had worked out an arrangement. He would have me during the school year, and she would have me during the summer, and that I could call her any time. I felt a little better. She then hugged me, we said our goodbyes, and I went into the house. The next morning we left. On the way there, my father told me that he bought a house for us to live in, just outside of town, for barely next to nothing. It was a house referred to by the townspeople, unbeknownst to us at the time, as, the doll house on the hill. Kind of corny, right? We later found out why they called it that, and why it was so cheap, but more on that later. Now, it was a big house, huge even. It was three stories high, four if you counted the attic, with seven bedrooms, three and a half bathrooms, a large industrial-sized kitchen, a living room bigger than most studio apartments, two fireplaces, a parlor, a study, and a full-sized, fully functioning in-ground swimming pool, and what looked to be a child's playground in the basement. That's right. The basement. Complete with a slide, a sand pit, a metal climbing structure, a swing set, a few bouncy balls, and building blocks, with astroturf on the floor giving the illusion of grass, as well as six little doors, about four feet tall, three on the left, and three on the right which was kind of odd to me. The house also had a small conservatory, or greenhouse if you will, on the backside of it. I told you it was huge. It came fully furnished with old Victorian styled furniture and accessories. Now, the first couple nights we were there went rather uneventful. My father and I settled in, hung out, drank coffee, and talked. Shortly after that, things began to get weird, nothing too extreme, and could easily be explained away, but still unnerving. You see, my father chose a bedroom on the second floor, and I chose to make the attic my bedroom. It was a huge attic that extended the whole length of the house, complete with a ceiling fan with lights in the middle, sand-colored carpet on the floor, and the drywall painted sky blue. The attic door had three little holes and a triangle pattern about three quarters of the way up on the left-hand side, as well as three identical holes, just in reverse, in the door frame next to the other three holes, like someone put a hasp or a padlock on there, and then removed it. There was already a twin bed and a small dresser with a lamp up there, the rest was empty. So, I guess you could say, that the house had eight bedrooms. Anyway, I was lying in bed one night, the moonlight shining in through the window, trying to go to sleep, when I heard them. Very faint whispers. I couldn't understand what was being said, and just chalked it up to the wind blowing through tiny air gaps between the window frame and the structure of the house, and just went to sleep. It was an old house after all. The next morning, I asked my father if he heard anything, and he said no, then left for work. 
I didn't start school until the coming Monday, so I was home all alone. With the cable guy scheduled to come on Tuesday, I couldn't watch TV, so I decided to explore the house a little. Downstairs was pretty much normal. Living room. Kitchen. Parlor. Study. A half bathroom, and the pool. The upstairs, however, was a little different. The second floor had two bedrooms on the left, and two on the right, a bathroom in the middle of the ones on the right, with a master bedroom, my father's bedroom, at the end of the hall with its bathroom, and a staircase leading up to the third floor on the right of the bedroom door. The third floor had two giant bedrooms, one on the left, and one on the right, a bathroom at the end of the hall, and the attic door on the left of it. Why my father bought such a big house when there were only two of us, I didn't understand, but I liked it. I remembered the layout from when my father and I first walked through. Anyway, I then began exploring the unused bedrooms. I walked into the first bedroom on the left, and there was nothing out of the ordinary, at first. There was a bed, an armoire, a desk with a mirror, a chair in the corner, and an area rug on the floor. Normal. Right? Well, it wasn't until I went into the closet that it became not so normal. I opened the closet door, and there, right in front of me, was another four-foot-high door, just like the ones in the basement. What the hell? I thought. I bent down and extended my hand to open it when I heard a little girl giggle right behind me. I quickly leapt to my feet, spun around, and there was no one there who was that? I yelled. Come play with us, I heard a little girl's voice say from behind me, followed by another giggle. I turned back around to see the little door opening all by itself, and an arm slowly extending out of it. I was completely terrified. I ran out of the room, down the stairs, out the front door, and ran halfway into the yard, turning back to look at the house. I swear I saw a little girl with blonde hair, wearing a blue dress, standing in the window of the room I just ran out of. She was waving at me. I nearly shit myself. I blinked my eyes a couple of times, and she was gone. Needless to say, I did not go back to that house until my father came home. That was a long and hot day. Anyway, when my father got home, I told him what happened, he just laughed, and said, you have such a wild imagination, no wonder you're a writer, and went into the house. I cautiously followed behind him and didn't let him out of my sight all night long. Well, except when he used the bathroom, but I was close by. I slept with every light I could find in my room that night. The ceiling light, the lamp light, and even my phone light. My phone was dead in the morning though. I charged it in the kitchen while I had coffee with my father. Then he left for work again. Now, even though the voices, and seeing that little girl in the window freaked me out. I was intrigued by the little door. So, I grabbed my phone, and to try and protect myself, I grabbed the Bible off the coffee table in the living room and carried it upstairs with me. I wanted to see if every bedroom had a little door in the closet, and they did. Well, I don't know about my father's room, I didn't check there, and my room didn't have one. Anyway, I wanted to see where the doors led to. So, I went into the room across from the room that freaked me out, opened the closet door, saw the little door, and opened it. Pure darkness. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and shined it inside. There I saw a set of old wooden steps leading down. Now, I am 6 feet 2 inches tall, so I wasn't going to fit through a 4 foot door. I got down on my hands and knees and crawled through the door, and very carefully maneuvered my way down the steps, still holding the Bible in my left hand, and the flashlight in my right hand to lead the way. After about 15 minutes of painfully crawling down the steps, I came to another door. I pushed it open and discovered I was at the basement playground. I crawled through the door, stood up, stretched, and said holy shit. This is cool. Hidden passages. Man, I love this house. I said aloud. I then ran to the middle door across the room, opened it, and began crawling up the steps, using my flashlight once again to lead the way. These steps were steeper than the other ones. I got about halfway up when there appeared to be sunlight shining down from above, like someone or something opened the little door above me. I looked up and saw another little girl walk through the door, and begin walking down the steps. This one wore a light green dress and had brown hair. I was frozen in fear. 
I couldn't turn around. I couldn't stand up. Hell, I couldn't even move. I watched in complete horror as this little girl ghost walked down the stairs and directly through me. Not stepped over me. Not stepped on me. But went through me. As she did, my entire body became freezing. Find us, Michael. Find us, she said, as I watched her walk down the steps and out the other door. How does she know my name, I thought. I immediately crawled, as fast as I could, up the steps, and out of the door, into one of the large third floor bedrooms. I then ran downstairs, put the Bible back on the coffee table, and sat on the couch for the rest of the day, even after my father came home. I didn't even eat dinner that night. I slept on the couch, as I didn't want to go anywhere near either one of those rooms. Sometime in the night, I had a real bizarre dream. I was downstairs in the basement, directly in the middle of the playground. I heard a little girl giggle, then the third swing on the swing set next to me started swinging all by itself. I went running up the stairs, but when I got to them, about 20 bouncy balls came bouncing down the stairs, directly at me. I swatted them away, but some of them got through and hit me in my face, my chest, and my stomach. Heart. Harder than a ball should have from that angle, distance, and speed. I fell to the ground, closed my eyes, and covered my head with my arms. I then tucked up into the fetal position, as more balls slammed down onto me. Tag. You're it. I heard a little girl's voice say, followed by another giggle. The balls then stopped hitting me, so I opened my eyes. I was then laying on the cold cement floor of the greenhouse. What the hell? I thought. I sat up, and saw another little girl, wearing a yellow dress with red hair, bouncing an orange ball, about 20 feet away from me. Bounce. Bounce. I reached out to her. Bounce. Bounce. Find us, Michael, she said, find the dolls. And floated down into the floor, and disappeared. I was completely horrified. I closed my eyes once again and screamed like a wild man. I woke up, still screaming. My father came running, I could hear his loud footsteps on the hardwood floor. He rounded the corner of the living room. Michael. What's wrong? What's the matter son? He said, leaning over me. Bad dream, dad. That's all. Bad dream, I said. He smiled. It's time to get up for school anyway son. I'm glad you're okay. You scared the shit out of me. Come on in the kitchen. I just made fresh coffee he said, then rustled my hair, and walked away. I got up, had coffee, and got ready for my first day at my new school. I had to go upstairs to get dressed, so I ran up the stairs, ran past the first bedroom, up the other set of stairs, past the second bedroom, and up the attic stairs, into my room. I got dressed as fast as I could, then ran back downstairs. My father was just leaving for work. Now, since I didn't have a driver's license yet, I had to take the bus. I walked out of the house, down the long driveway, and waited at the end of it. The bus came, stopped, and picked me up. I stepped on the bus and immediately felt every single eyeball staring at me, including the driver. I walked down the aisle, heads turning as I did. I was just about to pass this one kid, about my age, kinda chubby, with red hair and freckles, who then leaned over to the kid next to him, and whispered, that kid's crazy. I wouldn't step foot in the dollhouse. Now, I'm from Detroit, and although I never considered myself to be a tough guy, I was not going to stand there and let some kid that I didn't even know talk shit about me either. I stopped walking, took a step back, and said to the kid, if you got something to say, man, just say it. I'm right here. He turned his head back, with his mouth open wide, and said nervously stuttering, I was just saying them you'd have to be um crazy to live in the dollhouse. The what? I thought slightly puzzled, remembering what the little girl said in the dream. I took the empty seat behind him, and next to this really cute chubby girl, as the bus rolled on. After a few seconds, I tapped him on the shoulder, and asked, they call it the what? He turned around to answer, just as the bus driver yelled out, no talking. Eyes forward Thomas. He quickly turned his head back around, as I sat back in my seat. When we got to the school, Thomas jetted off the bus, and I didn't see him all day until we were getting back on the bus. 
What I did see, was almost everyone in the class, and the hallway staring, pointing, and whispering. I just ignored them. I can't fight the whole school, right? Anyway, I waited outside the bus for Thomas to arrive, and when he did, I stopped him. Look, man. You have to tell me what's up with the house, I said. On the bus, you too. Let's go, the bus driver said. I'll get off where you get off, and I'll walk home. I said to him, as we both got on the bus. Over time, we became good friends. Now, as I said, I got off at his house. We stood outside on the sidewalk, and he told me something I did not expect to hear. So, what's up with the houseman? I asked. He looked left, then right, then back to me and whispered, my parents don't want me talking about this, but... He then looked around again, then continued. About eight years ago, some crazy shit happened at your houseman. Some creepy. Crazy shit. Back then, it was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Chester, descendants of the people who started this town. They were the richest people in it, that's why it's sitting on a hill. They thought they were better than everyone because they had money. One day, Mr. Chester was killed in a boating accident, which left Mrs. Chester alone in the house. They never had any kids, but rumor has it, that Mrs. Chester wanted kids, girls to be exact. As the years went on, Mrs. Chester's mental state diminished, and she went crazy, from being all alone in the house, so they say. Around that time, several little girls, around five or six years old, went missing. Police were baffled. Then there was a break in the case. One of the surveillance videos showing one of the abductions at the mall, clearly showed that Mrs. Chester was the abductor. When the police closed in on the house, they heard six gunshots. The cops stormed the house and found the dead bodies of five little girls with gunshot wounds to the chest, and Mrs. Chester with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head, laying on the floor in the living room. Mrs. Chester survived somehow and is now a permanent resident of the Chestertown home for the criminally insane. A home that she had built. Ironic, isn't it? Now, according to doctor's records and police reports, Mrs. Chester admitted to kidnapping and killing all the 12 little girls, over three years, when she grew tired of them, or they began to fight back and replace them with other little girls. Five of the girls were found in the house, returned to their parents, and given a proper burial. All the cops in town, and their families, attended each funeral to show respect. That's how I know. Another thing I know is the bodies of the other seven little girls were never found, and are believed to be buried somewhere on the property. She was rich, why didn't she just adopt a kid, I thought. He continued by saying, several big-name news channels covered the story. Our own newspaper's photographer took a picture of the five dead girls in the living room and said that they all looked, and were dressed like little porcelain dolls. That's where the house gets its name, the doll house on the hill. The house is said to be haunted by the spirits of all the little girls. I wouldn't go near that place. How do you know all the gory details? I asked. My father the police captain, I overheard him talking about it on the phone when I was little, he answered. Thomas Richard Bennett. You get in this house right now, mister. You have chores to do. A strong female voice yelled from the house. Okay, mom. Thomas said, I have to go, man. See you tomorrow in school. As he ran up the walkway, and into the house. Just then my phone rang, it was my father. I answered it, hey dad. I stopped off at. I began to say. Where the hell is you? Get home now. He yelled and hung up on me. I thought I was in trouble. Luckily my house was only a mile away. You have to love Google Maps. Anyway, I ran home, expecting to get a stern talking to. I opened the door and yelled, Dad, where are you? There was no answer, so I called him. Dad, where are you? I asked. At the pool. Get in here. Now, he yelled, and my father never yells. So, the fact that he was yelling, told me something was wrong. I didn't hear the anger in my father's voice. No. I heard fear. Dad. I screamed, ending the call, then running down the hallway, through the kitchen, and to the pool room door. That's right. I said pool room. You thought it was an outdoor pool, didn't you? 
Nah, this thing has its room. It was completely enclosed, with three huge cinder block walls, extending the height of the house, and a glass paneled wall, the height of the house as well, overlooking the entire town. And it wasn't your normal size swimming pool either. No. It was an Olympic size swimming pool, complete with dive mounts, two diving springboards, one was at the 1 meter height, while the other was at the 4 meter height. It even had a lifeguard stand. It was amazing. Anyway, as soon as I got to the kitchen, I heard a door being slammed hard and fast. I soon discovered it was the pool room door. In between the opening and the closing of the door, I could see my father, through the flashing of the overhead fluorescent lights. He was curled up, in a sitting position in the far left corner of the room, wearing a bathing suit, next to a pile of clothes, with his wallet and phone sitting on top. He was moving his head quickly from side to side, with a look of fear on his face. I had never seen my father act that way before, so to see him like that scared me to death. Dad! I screamed and attempted to run through the door while it was open. But, I wasn't fast enough. The door came back and slammed hard against my right side, knocking me against the wall and down to the floor. I got to my feet and saw what my father was so afraid of. The overhead lights were flashing, like a strobe light on crack. Both diving boards were bouncing up and down, completely on their own, and seconds later, a visible splash in the water, like an invisible being been jumping off the boards, and landing in the water. The lifeguard stand was rocking back and forth, while the sounds of little girls laughing and giggling filled the air, and echoed around the room. Dad! I screamed and walked as fast as I could over to him. You should never run near a pool. Anyway, what's happening? He said loudly to me. It's the dolls, Dad. I responded, I don't think they'll hurt us. They just want to play. What the hell are you talking about? He said. I'll explain later, Dad. Let's get out of here. I replied. I then helped my father up, he grabbed his things, and we briskly walked over to the door, which was still opening and closing. We can't get out he said, frantically looking around. I just stood there for a second, took a deep breath, turned around, and screamed, I know what happened to you, and I'm sorry. I will find you. I will. Please stop. The second I finished screaming, everything stopped. No more bouncing diving boards. No more flashing lights. Nothing. All was calm and still. As everything stopped, my father and I both heard, Several little girls, all in unison say, find us, please. We turned our heads back around and saw not seven, but about twenty transparent images of little girls, wearing different colored dresses, with different colored hair, and from different ethnic backgrounds. They were standing side by side on the edge of the pool, completely dry and not a hair out of place. Then they just vanished into thin air. What the fuck? My father said, completely puzzled. Come on dad, let's get out of here. I'll explain in the truck. I said. I opened the pool room door and walked with my father out to his truck. He put his clothes back on, right there in the driveway. We got in, he pulled his keys out of his pants, and started the truck, completely overwhelmed. Are you okay to drive, dad? I asked. I think so. He replied, putting the truck in drive, and rolling down the driveway. We drove around for a while, without saying a word. My father then pulled into the parking lot of the coffee shop across the street from the local grocery store. Bet you can't guess the name of it. Anyway, we walked in, placed our order, got it, and sat down at a table. My father then broke the silence. I should have listened to you son, instead of blowing it off. I apologize, he said. It's okay dad, I replied, it is hard to believe. What was that? He asked. Well, dad. You see, about eight years ago, our house was owned by this rich couple. He died, she went crazy without him, started kidnapping little girls, killed them, and buried them in our yard somewhere. I have to find them. I replied. He looked at me dumbfounded. My friend Thomas told me about it. His father is the police captain, I said. He didn't say anything after that. We drank our coffee and got back in the truck. Can we stop by the library so I can do some research? I asked. Sure. 
Why not? My father replied, I'll drop you off, and I'll come to get you when you're done. Where are you going, dad? I asked. I'm going to the police station, to see if they'll confirm your story, he replied. Anyway, he dropped me off, and I made a beeline for the computers. After three hours of searching, I discovered something. The conservatory was not part of the original build, it was added on later, about six months before the cops raided the house. The little girl from that dream floated down into the floor of the conservatory. That's gotta, be it. Now, why would you build a conservatory with a concrete floor? Ding, ding, ding. Survey says. To hide the bodies. I can't believe the cops missed this. I thought. I immediately called my father and told him what I had found. He picked me up, and said, you were right son. The cops confirmed it all. It looks like we got some digging to do. I don't like that greenhouse thing anyway. I just smiled. We decided not to go back to the house that night and got a room at the local flop house. The next morning, I didn't go to school, instead, I went with my father to Allwright Rentals and rented a jackhammer, and the accessories, to break up the concrete, as well as two pairs of ear protectors, and I am sure glad we did. That thing was loud as hell and quite heavy. Now, my little 6 foot 2, 140 pound self, didn't even try to operate that thing. I would have killed myself. My father, on the other hand, is a big linebacker looking guy. He easily picked that thing up and went to town with it. Hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Back up just a little. We got back to the house, and moved all the tables, the plants, and the tools, out of the greenhouse. Conservatory. Whatever you want to call it. We waited for the cable guy to arrive. He did his thing and left about a half hour later, and we got to work. Like I said. My father grabbed that thing, connected the chisel bit, we both put our ear guards on, he plugged it in and destroyed the concrete slab. After about three hours of breaking up that concrete, taking breaks from time to time, my father was finally done, then we moved the concrete pieces outside. I took the lighter ones, while my father took the rest. Then we began digging, piles of dirt were everywhere. After digging for about two hours, you'll never guess what we found. Wait for it. Wait for it. Nothing. Just dirt. What the hell, I thought, I was sure I was right. My father just gave me an if you weren't my son, I'd freaking kill you right now look. He laid his shovel down and went into the house. I laid my shovel down as well. I just stood there, in this huge hole that we just dug, completely dumbfounded. I grabbed one of the shovels, and slammed it down hard in the dirt, out of pure frustration, and it hit something. Wait a minute. I thought. I cleared that pile of dirt and looked into the hole. There, in the hole, was what appeared to be an old white sheet. Well, I'm sure it was white at one time anyway. I fell to my knees and began digging with my hands. Dad. Dad. I found something, I screamed. My father then came back in. There's nothing here son, he stated. Yes, there is dad. Look, I responded excitedly and pointed in the hole. My father came over and looked in the hole. Holy Jesus, he said loudly dropping to his knees, and helping me hand scoop the dirt. After a few minutes, the sheet was completely exposed. It was small, about 4 feet in length. My father then grabbed the sheet and tore it open. And yes. It was bones, human bones. I found them. I screamed, getting back on my feet, jumping up and down, and waving my arms in the air, I found them. Calm down son. We have to call the police. My father said. And that is exactly what he did. The cops came and continued digging where we left off. The town coroner came as well. Now, remember when I told you that Mrs. Chester admitted to killing 12 little girls? She lied. The cops found 17 bodies buried under the greenhouse. They were all neatly wrapped in white sheets. The coroner had to make several trips back and forth to pick up all the bodies. When the cops finally allowed us back in the house, it was about 2 a.m. at that point, my father and I just went to bed. As I laid there, happy about finding the dolls, I heard several little girl voices say in unison, thank you. I smiled, and just went to sleep. Days later, 
A newspaper article stated that all 17 girls were identified through DNA testing. They are, names retracted for privacy. It also stated that they too were returned to their families for a proper burial. My father and I attended every one of the funerals. We put all the dirt back in the hole and even out the ground. We decided to leave the greenhouse structure intact and made a kind of outdoor sitting room out there. My father had 22 individual nameplates made, with all the girls' names on them. The 17 that were buried under the greenhouse, and the 5 that were killed when the cops raided the house, in case you were wondering where I got that number from. All the nameplates are mounted to the far wall of the basement playground. I go down there sometimes, sit on the swings, and look at the names. I hope they found peace. I was the talk of the school for a little while, in a good way that is until the boiler blew up at that grocery store I mentioned earlier. Strange things are always happening there. It sounds like a pretty cool place to work. I'm thinking about trying to get a job there. What do you think? Anyway, as I said before, Thomas and I became excellent friends. I spent the night at his house a couple of times, and he spent the night at the mine since all the ghost girls were gone. He is completely infatuated with the hidden passages and loves the pool. I called my mom and told her what happened. She said that I was very brave, and that she was proud of me, you know, normal mom stuff. Dad and I still live in the house and I had no further paranormal incidents oh yeah. By the way, I finally got my driver's license, and bought a 1967 Ford Mustang hardtop, with flames down the side, from the local towing service in town. The cops had it towed a while back, and the guy that owned it never came to pick it up. So now it's mine. Now, remember the cute chubby girl from the first time I rode the bus? Well, we're going on a date this coming Friday. Her name is Susan. I like her. Well, it's getting late, you guys. I have to get a shower and hit the hay. I've got school in the morning. Hope you like my story. Good night, everyone.